So we're looking at the community of, of wasps associated with these um, oak galls. So the parasitoids, the inquilines, the oak galls themselves, and relating it back to some work that's already been done on the oak trees. And looking to see if all these different groups of species that are interacting in the, in the system actually have shared evolutionary histories. So they all come from the same origin, well, the same geographic origin. They've all dispersed as a whole intact unit across, across the globe is what we're looking at at the moment. The alternative hypothesis is that the community of wasps you see associated with these goals in different spots is actually just it's a random assemblage of species and it's different in each in different locations so the parasitoids might have in one location might have a very different evolutionary history from the gall wasps in a separate different location there's a separate history the parasitoids might have a separate history again and that would suggest if if that's the case what we see as communities when we just go out and look at species interacting in the wild may in fact just be totally unpredictable effectively and different species within that community will respond to changes in the environment differently whereas if they've all have a shared history they've all been associated with each other over with each other over a very very long time if we get changes in the environment climate change or something like that the whole unit will move instead of individual species having their own different um, responses now um, as an a geneticist, you're able to establish a uh, geographic timeline that wouldn't have been able to be done by other methods. Is that part of? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? So yes, one one thing we're doing with the genetics, um, there is an idea out there that there is a at least some genes show a constant rate of mutation over time. So we can measure the amount of the divergence levels, the amount of difference between um, the DNA sequences of two particular species and use this constant rate of mutation as a way of calibrating that so we get an idea about how far back in the past those two species actually diverged. So we can do that for uh, all of our different, again, for all of our different trophic levels, for the parasitoids, for the gall wasps, for the oak trees and see how they've responded in time as well as looking at the, the shape of the, the phylogenetic trees and looking to see how they responded across geographic space. Or do um, you finding any reason why they uh, tended to focus on the oak tree as a host? The So this association between the cynipid uh, wasps and the oak trees is a very old thing. There's fossils suggesting that they've been associating for the last 40-odd million years. Um, and they appear not to have shifted. So with some of the work we're doing in the Western Palearctic, so sort of Europe and, and the Middle East, we've demonstrated that actually the gall, the gall wasps change host oaks very, very infrequently. So as George said, there were, there were different groups of oaks, different groups of species. And those different groups of oaks have their own gall wasp faunas, and there's no switch between the two. We found that the, the rate of or the change over evolutionary time, time of gall wasps moving from one group to a sec another group is very, very rare. So it's happened literally the sort of almost the, the minimal number of times to actually get the pattern that we see at the moment. Is your uh, evidence supporting the idea that uh, on the various continents that uh, they were dispersed by travel or did they evolve independently? Is there any indication to the genetics of... So there's some suggestion that um, the, the oak gall has probably evolved in Asia and have moved different that's sort of diversified there and different lineages have actually moved into North America and have so sort of moved east into North America across what would have once been the Bering Land Bridge and then moved west into the rest of um, the Palearctic, so through Asia and th into Europe.
and different lineages appear to have done this independently. So there's, and it's, it's probably again just in response to very sort of global fluctuations in climate on a very very long time scale, and as the oak trees have responded to the, the environment changing, they've just brought their gall wasps along with them. Now, um, you mentioned that they aren't unique in having the alternating pattern of uh, sexuality. And of the other species that have that pattern, are there any common characteristics uh, or, uh, or, or are there any things about uh, species that evolve that pattern? That Nothing in particular. So, for instance, in the aphids, I think... I'm not quite sure about this, but I'm sure in some aphids show this this same alternation between a sexual generation with males and females and a, an asexual with just females that reproduce pathogenetically. And I think it's evolved multiple times, and there's no obvious reason why a particular lineage would do that. There's no obvious difference between them and one that just reproduces continually with um, both males and females. So. It's just a quirk, mm -hmm. a quirk of whatever particular group it is. Yeah. And insects have all sorts of weird and wonderful um, breeding systems like this. So. It, it never occurs outside the insect world, though, does it? Uh, yes, there are other things that do it, um, but off the top of my head. No, I can't it's touch you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there are other things. But there are yeah. other, other, many, many, many invertebrates have these weird breeding mm. systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other thing, actually, with with on the on the note of that alternating um, sexual and asexual generations, a lot of the species, both here in North America and in in Asia and Europe, have been described. Only one of the generations is known. So a lot of things, for instance, um, let me see if I can find a particular example on the table in front of me. So this species, for instance, this is a thing called... Diso um, yes, Dysocaspus chrysolepidus. This is only known from an asexual generation. Um, so there's no... only females will emerge from those gulls. And it may have a a sexual generation as well, but we don't know what it is. In contrast, species, this is um, a thing called Calliritis flora, which this, the sexual generation attacks these, attacks the acorns and stops them developing particularly well. Um, and we know people, have, I think, have done from experiments rearing out the wasps from this and presenting them with a, a tree, effectively, that we know there's a second, that the sexual generation of this is a, a species that induces galls on the petiole of the leaf, so the base of the leaf where it joins the, the twig. Um, but in a lot of species, that's not known. So we know an asexual generation or we know a sexual generation, and we don't know the alternative generation for them. So one thing that we can do with the genetics is because it's the same species, if we have... if we again, look at the DNA sequences, we can potentially match up those sexual and asexual generations that may be currently described as, as two different species, but in fact they're actually the same, just alternate generations of the same species. But, as I said, you can do this using rearing experiments, but they're very hard to do. You have to rear the, the insects. You have to give them a tree, contained bit of tree, so that nothing else gets in there wait for them to lay their eggs, wait for the next gall generation to be induced, and then repeat that cycle a few times so you can be confident that uh, it is the same, the same species, just alternating between two different gall types. But the genetics gives us a quick way to do that, because as they are the same species, their DNA sequences should be the same, and we can just you know, sequence them and, and try and match them up.